Okay, hey everyone. Welcome to today's Choose Growth Wednesday. This is the presentation, it's not a pop-up, meaning you can relax a bit more or you can engage with this, which I would love. Disclaimer, this said data science in healthcare, this is more gonna be machine learning in healthcare. And so, if anything, this should tantalize your taste buds for the machine learning sprints that are coming. So, this is gonna touch really on medical imaging and the relation, especially in South Africa and Africa, the role of machine learning and medical image analysis. But just for a little bit of context from everyone I can see here, who has any, would, would say like they've got any interests in medicine or has a medical background? Okay, so keep your hands up if that's an interest in medicine. And then hands up still if you have a medical background. Cool, so here in Joburg, you have a medical background. I'm not talking about like if you've got problems from like, <laughs> you know, you, you had a cold, are you wary of having coronavirus or something? No, I'm talking more so, you know, like you've maybe done a medical related degree or done studies in some area. Maybe you did a little bit of nursing or something like that. That's awesome. So just for context, I am going to be speaking about some medical terminology. And that's why, you know, I put it out there. And um, this is going to be like highlighting one of the important things that often happens when we try and do, you know, we come from a technical background and we walk into another technical background, such as something like medicine, and we often take for granted the fact that there's some context switching that needs to occur. I'm going to be saying some words that you won't be familiar with, and sometimes we have this tendency to like shut down the moment we hear terminology. Bear with me, I'll try and also just explain things in simple terms. I, I don't have a medical degree. I have family members who are doctors, and so in my research, and this is, you know, I'm presenting a little bit around some of the stuff I've touched during my research, but, you know, it's important to understand that, you know, there, there is some bridging that always will need to occur, and that's one of the big problems in data science when you try and jump into a domain. And hopefully you guys have had some appreciation in this when you've heard some of the other Choose Growth Wednesday talks, you know, there's, there's always nuances to different domains and I'm going to show you a new one. Hopefully it's colorful, hopefully by the end of this talk you will have some more aspirations to actually make a big difference because, I don't know, you can make a lot of profit in fintech but you can really make a lot of difference in people's lives when you look at a medical sphere. But there are a lot of barriers and hopefully that's what I'll flesh out during this. Okay. Cape Town's getting in, there's interest, that's fantastic guys, and hopefully we'll run with this. I'd like to make this interactive as possible. Damien's over here monitoring the stream, he's going to pose any questions that other campuses have. For you guys, it's easier, stick up your hand, ask a question, stop me wherever we are. We're going to try and keep to the time limit, so we want to end at half past 11 to respect your time. If there are further questions, we can just take it offline from there. Okay, so fantastic. Medical imaging within Africa, okay? Uh, promise or a poor prognosis, okay? Is this something good or bad? So, if, if this works, aha, uh -huh. let's start off with something somber, okay? Just to, to make us think about where we are, okay? And to give us context. So, this is Maura Michelle. He is the late former um, president of Mozambique. And, and he said these very, um, I suppose, worrying words. It, it gives us pause for thought. He says that the rich man's dog gets more in the way of vaccination, medicine, and medical care than do the workers upon whom the rich man's wealth is built. And I think if we look at and consider the context of Africa as a whole, yes, we have been at the brunt. Um, Africa as a whole, and you can look at myself as a, as a white individual, you know, apartheid is a reality, slavery is a reality, and it's left us with a whole bunch of nation states where healthcare in many senses is falling apart. And so we have to think of that, where we are currently. You know, to further put things into context, this is a kind of heat map of infectious diseases, respiratory infectious diseases, especially pneumonia, okay, affecting children around the world. And 95% of all childhood related deaths to respiratory diseases takes place within developing countries. Africa shares the brunt of that, okay? So this is something that, you know, 
Another statistic here is, as an African, you are three times more likely to die in your life from an infectious disease, not because Africa has some really funky infectious diseases, but simply we don't have the medical treatment to deal with that. These are very present preventable problems. We just don't have the infrastructure or the means. Okay? And the final kicker when we consider this, in a recent report by the World Economic Forum, not kind of recent, but in medical terms it is, all right, it was reported that by the year 2030, that's 10 years from now, we need to have a 12 times increase. Like We have to increase the number of doctors or clinicians we have by 12 times to deal with a patient burden because Africa's population is rising. Okay? We need more doctors. We currently don't have enough doctors. And so you can immediately stop and think like, hang, what do we do? We can't just say, okay, we're going to have 12 times the number of medical students going because we also have to keep this pipeline safe so you don't have this guy who, or girl one day who looks at you and says, I did six months of medicine, let me operate on your lungs or on your leg or something, okay? You can't just crank out more doctors. It's a, it's a problem, it's a constraint, okay? There is far more demand than supply. And so what we need to think about is how maybe machine learning can be used as a means to kind of augment or supplement this great need that we have in our nations. Okay, so with that in context, we have to kind of step back and just go, okay, wait, how does medical imaging come into the play here? How, how does it have a role? So I'm going to walk you through hopefully quite a very brief but scenic view of medical imaging as a whole so that we can kind of align around what that really is. I'm going to start out with a picture of this guy. He has a very fine beard. I'm not trying to emulate him with my stubble here. That's just my tardiness. Um, but this is a German physicist called Wilhelm Konrad Rottingen. And essentially, one day, this guy in, he, in the University of Würzburg was sitting down and he had his wife in his lab. And I don't know many researchers that do this. But he, you'll see, and maybe let me just try and get the pointer over here so I can show things. He was sitting with this thing in his hand, and that's a cathode ray tube. And when you put a high voltage across it, it emits this, th this stuff called ionizing radiation. Okay, We've all heard of it. It's x-rays. And so what he did was he had this cathode ray tube, and for some reason, he placed his wife's hand in between a cathode ray tube and a collector plate. And what ended up happening, I have no idea why he would do that. Like, honey, just come over. I want to do an experiment on your hand. I've never done this before. But he put his wife's hand between this collector plate and this cathode ray tube. And what appeared on an Im as an image on this collector plate was what appeared to be the skeletal like silhouette of his wife's hand and a really big wedding ring. Goodness, we don't make them like that anymore. But, he, but essentially, what he had done is he had produced the first ever radiograph. Okay? And he had done so with this ionizing radiation. And this was, a la this was a huge breakthrough because never before had we as humans been able to look inside our bodies without actually doing damage to them, without cutting them open or someone already had their head kind of broken open. We don't do many x-rays of the head, but we had kind of turned a corner in technology where we suddenly could look inside the body. We could look inside and see its problems or just a kind of... Like, kind of get the lay of the land without actually having to cause any harm. And that was pretty dang fundamental. It was, it, was, it was revolutionary. Okay? So just to give you context, that's a radiograph. It's, it's typically referred to as an x-ray that you'd have. Who here has had an x-ray before? All right. Sorry for you. It probably wasn't because you just felt like having one. Something went wrong. All right. But yeah, x-rays are the most common like imaging modality, and when I say modality, type of image we take medically. It's the most common thing we do in the world. About out of every you know, like medical procedure, one or I think it's two thirds of them are often a chest x-ray or an x-ray that you'll have taken of yourself. But there are other ways that we do imaging now, and it's gone further. The first is an extension of an x-ray. Often in an x-ray, you'll have like the radioactive source. So something like that cathode ray tube placed between you and, or you are placed between it and like a condenser or collector plate. All right. What, if anyone's ever heard of CT or computer tomography before, essentially all you do is instead of having that x-ray source in a fixed place, it spins around you very rapidly. Okay. 
and there's a mathematical or it's, a, it's a, like a field of study called tomography where you're able to take all the information from these x-rays passing through you and you can reconstruct a like the interior of a structure okay so computer tomography you're essentially taking an x-ray that is really fast and is whizzing around you and what that can give you is in this image over here it can give you a slice of your body now okay so first of all we had like this projection if you think of taking a chest x-ray or taking an arm x-ray you're going like looking at the side view and there's medical terminology for this but like you can take a frontal or a posterior view of the body essentially now we're taking a transverse section okay and that's really cool because now you can look at all these structures here's someone's spine you know there's part of the liver over here so you can see kind of into a person who's ever had a ct scan before all right some of you have had a shame of bendigo that probably wasn't a happy thing either all right so one of the the problems with you know doing ct scans is they have very poor contrast meaning just like that you know that x-ray of like Wilhelm Conrad's wife, you could see the bony structures. The soft structure, apparent, well, not apparently, it doesn't show too well because, you know, that ionizing radiation as it goes through it doesn't pick up all the soft tissue. So to kind of combat that, people came up with this thing called mag like an MRI scan, magnetic resonance imaging. And essentially there, we're kind of exploiting the internal structure of soft tissue. And what we do is we ionize the tissue or living tissue. We get hydrogens to, I won't go into the science of it, but emit protons essentially that can be detected. And in a not so similar way, you also, just like a CT scan, you go into this big sort of tube, but here, you know, there's different apparatus and what it's able to do is reconstruct an internal image of you again, but this time it's softer tissue that has a lot more contrast. So instead of seeing bones and things like that, we can now take like, well contrasted images of the brain and the reason why we got one contrast is we can see differences better you can differentiate between different parts of your body and stuff okay so that's mri we've gone even further than that and i don't think anyone in this country would have had or many of you here because this is quite a rare procedure it's more common in america and first world countries and that's a pet scan positron emission tomography and really to cut a very technical thing short, we make biological markers. So you make like this biological substance and you make it ionized so that it emits radiation. You inject it into the body and you make sure that it can bind to a specific organ. So for example, you can make this biomarker that adheres to certain regions of the brain. And what you do is you do a scan which will detect um, the substance as it's adhered to a certain organ. And for example, because we can make it so specific, You'll see in these images over here, this is someone with Alzheimer's disease or comparing people with Alzheimer's disease. And here, this is a normal PET scan, mild cognitive impairment is seen. And that's because we've got this marker, this biomarker that's attaching only to healthy brain matter. And so because there's this like blank region here and for full-blown Alzheimer's disease, a far larger one, you can see neurodegeneration. You can see parts of the brain that aren't functional or happy anymore. Okay. So, that's just an overview. We are still speaking about this, remember, and that's the context. We're still wanting to increase the number of clinicians we have artificially. So that's still a problem, okay? So how do we solve this, and how does this imaging have anything to do with this big problem? Well, it's the simple thing called computer-aided diagnosis, okay? So another history lesson, very quickly. Does anyone have any questions on what I spoke about previously? Cool, we will then go on. So now with this clean shaven guy, we speak about this guy. This is uh, Willem Lodwig. They all have quite difficult German sounding names or like uh, Dutch and things. So this was a radiologist and he was quite advanced for his time because he was used to detecting lung cancer. And what guys used to do, radiologists, is they would get this like x-ray and they would take out a ruler and they would see like, ah, oh, uh, Mr. Fenter or so-and-so, you know, Jonathan, you've come in, I, I take your x-ray and I'm gonna measure these little round like, op like opaque circles and I think that is lung cancer and they'll take measurements and based on those measurements they would say, aha, this is cancer or it's not cancer, okay? So you can see how there's like this 
very empirical process of having to take a measurement, characterize your measurements, and that would give you an end result. And what he kind of did is he, this is in the 1960s, he, he was close to computer programming or computer science, and he said, well, if I'm taking these manual measurements of you know, an image, surely a computer, if I feed it the manual measurements, will do a better job of guessing than me just kind of out of my head going, okay, five centimeters, slightly round, this must be cancer. Okay, and so essentially he implemented this thing called a naive Bayes classifier. You guys will learn about it in the machine learning sprint, and so I know that some of these concepts you won't be too familiar with, but he's essentially, he's taken features, he's taken information, given it to the computer, the computer has this internal model and it spits out a result, and that's a fundamental way of thinking of classification for machine learning, okay? So he did that, and it was a success, okay? He was getting some pretty amazing results based on this process of he would do these manual measurements, put them into his computer, it would spit out cancer or not cancer. And so what that led to is this entire field of computer-aided diagnosis. And very quickly, people started running with this idea, hey, if we could get in a way to automate taking these measurements, getting the computer to crunch the numbers and then spitting an output, soon we're gonna have R2D2, or that's actually C3PO, in the medical room operating on people. Okay, we are going to have computers completely replacing doctors because computers can do this better than doctors. I'm sure you guys have heard that recently in the news, right? Similar sort of narratives going around. Well, this was already in the 1960s, okay? Before we had things like the AI winters, which some of you may have heard of. This period where people hype up artificial intelligence only to find out it can't do a simple menial thing and so it falls apart. Okay. So people realized very quickly, though, that you can't just have a computer doing all this medical stuff. There were far too many disconnects, and it's an extremely, extremely difficult problem to actually try and solve. And so what that led to is this notion of computer, they originally called it computer automated diagnosis because the computer was going to do everything. And instead, they realized that it should probably be some sort of a deal between doctors and computers. Like... I give the computer certain information, it gives me a result, but I'm still very much in the picture as a doctor or as a clinician. I have to be there every step of the way because if I just let the computer do it, people are going to die from cancer because it won't be detected or it will suggest that you cut off all your arms to prevent certain conditions and stuff. It, it just wouldn't work. Okay. So now computer-aided diagnosis as a field of study forms part of a bigger picture, a bigger workflow where kind of clinicians and computer scientists work together to do things. Okay, and one of the main takeaways in all the studies is if you try and as a doctor give, like if you're given this computer-aided diagnosis system, just say you've got the system that given an input image will tell you whether something's wrong or not, it has to be extremely efficacious, and that means it has to work very well in order for it to actually help the doctor, because there have been a lot of studies where if you're given an imperfect system, like this machine kind of gets it right eight out of ten times, the doctor ends up doing worse, because they start relying on this machine to give them right, correct information, they're given the incorrect information, things blow up, okay? And they actually end up relying too much. There's quite severe bias, and things you know, go to pair. So I'm not going to speak about some current usages of computer-aided diagnosis, and that will link back to how it can solve this problem of needing you know, a huge step in the number of clinicians. But before we do that, I have to speak about an extremely high-level overview of deep learning, because I will speak about deep learning, and I don't want people to kind of like be worrying at the back of their mind, what on earth is this deep learning thing? Okay, this is extremely high view. I mask all the complexity here. Okay. But you guys are familiar with neural networks. Yes, no. Okay, some of you will be, some of you won't be because we haven't done machine learning, the sprints yet. But I think it's so much in the media and because you probably title yourselves as data scientists, you'll get like your, your, your news feed will have something about neural networks and I'm sure you're interested enough in the subject to read up about it. Anyway, so over here we have a shallow neural network, okay? Essentially, it has this thing called an input layer and sorry, this isn't my own image. I've shamelessly, at the last minute, stolen it, okay? So you have an input layer. Essentially, what that accepts is a whole bunch of data. It's passed 
you know, these, these are like input nodes. These lines represent weights, okay? At the end of the day, this entire thing is just one big matrix of numbers, okay? That's how we model this entire thing. But these are weights, and so information goes into the input layer. There's a nonlinear activation. There's basically like a, a certain operation you do on the information, and this is represented all in numbers, okay? It's passed through to this inner set of nodes. These are, this is called a hidden layer. Once again, there's a, a weighted computation at each of these nodes. There's an, like an, an activation function that is used to kind of make this computation um, more amenable to generate better things. And then that's back to this output layer. And at this output layer, you often get a distribution of what this input data was. Like if this is data of a certain type, there should be a prediction here, or there's a higher level representation of what this information is. If you don't worry about it, or you don't have to really know what this is, but suffice to say, you've got information coming in, it's processed in this network, and what spats out is often a prediction of something. So for our case, this could be a medical image. It's turned into numbers. Those numbers get passed through this network, and on the out here, it could be a prediction of what was in that medical image. Okay, are we all happy there? Any major questions? Okay, so what do you think deep learning is? Any ideas? If, 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 this, is, if this is a neural network, and it's a non-deep neural network, what is deep learning? Okay, so all that we do is we add more layers. Okay, that is really, okay, there's a, there's a lot more to it, but really what I want you to think of, if someone says a deep neural network, it's really someone decided to put a few more hidden layers. Okay, it's often more than three and they aren't always, you know, the architectures vary quite a lot and there's convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, um, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of nuances. There's graph neural networks and things like that. But really what I want you to think about is there's two constraints for our talk that we need to think about. The network gets deeper, and that's why we call it a deep neural network, but fundamentally to us, because these things represent what's known as the state of the art, these are the sort of machine learning models that are giving the best results. All that we have to do, or one of the constraints to train these machine learning models better, and you will have plenty of experience training different models from you know, regression onwards as machine learning sprints. You'll get you know, in this paradigm of what it means to actually train a model and stuff. But suffice to say, for a deep neural network, you need a lot more data to put into this model for it to give good answers on the output. And that's what we just have to keep in mind, okay, when we're trying to contextualize everything over here. So, that allows us, thinking of this, like, deep learning, moving on to modern applications of computer-aided diagnosis. You know, just some things that we're able to do, and I'm going to speak about this at a very high level. Okay? What we're able to do now is this idea of organ and lesion detection. So what typically happens, you know, we spoke about those different types of imaging earlier. If you go in and have an MRI done, maybe it's at a fancy, ho like, fancy hospital down the road, maybe Charlotte Matheke or you know, somewhere in, in Durban or in Cape Town, wherever you are, and you have this MRI done, the end result is you know, the radiologists, the people who have done this imaging on you will have essentially like terabytes of data, okay? And what it is are these thin slices, it's often at a millimeter sort of resolution, but these thin slices of your body in this huge stack. And what they have to go through is, or do, is they have to look at the stack layer by layer until they get to a point. First of all, they have to orientate themselves because at this, like, if you're just looking at an image like this, and I know it's hard to see, um, it's really hard to see what organ you're actually looking at. And you have to orientate yourself for where in the body you are. Then you have to kind of go, wait, which organ am I looking at? Because you aren't looking at a nice constructed view of it. You're looking at like this transverse section. So it's really hard to actually make out what is happening. So it's a very time consuming process looking for things that are wrong and then being able to diagnose them thereafter. 
So one thing that we can now do with computer-aided diagnosis quite effectively is this idea of organ and lesion detection. And that's that this, like, this machine learning model will be able to go through this entire, this huge cube or volume of data that's your body that's been scanned. And it will immediately be able to go, ah, this squiggle over here must be your pancreas. Okay, and it's able to determine this. All right. And it's also be able to determine, wait, I see something squiggly that cannot be the pancreas. This must be something wrong. Maybe you've been in a motor accident and your kidney is ruptured. It's able to detect when something is wrong as well. Okay? And we can do that pretty accurately. I won't speak about mainly the architectures that are involved in this, but there are just, suffice to say, I'll share this presentation at the end. If you go to these references, these speak about different like neural network architectures that are able to process this and find this information out efficiently. Okay? Another thing that we do is this notion of segmentation. And that's like saying, you know, given a medical image, I want you to just highlight where um, like blood cells are, if we've got a blood smear. Or given you know, like a certain part of the body, I want you to highlight only certain aspects of it, okay? And we are able to, this is a very famous architecture. I know it just looks like a whole bunch of blue pancakes on their side stacked together. But really, this is something called the UNET, okay? It was made in 2015. It's a very famous architecture that's very good at segmenting biological imagery and actually all imagery. And it's called UNET because this looks like a big U when the architecture is actually put into place, okay? We also do, you know, this is a, an indication, you know, and this is a theme that we'll see later on. Um, sometimes in segmentation, you know, previous approaches have been to, to take an image like this one over here. And segmentation means that you're trying to color in or find certain tissue of a certain type, an attribute to it. And this was just an example of how when computer scientists, and as I say, I'll pick up on this theme at the end of the talk as well. When computer scientists started trying to do this, they would go the normal way of trying to find the entire image being shaded in. They would try and find all the tissue related to a certain organ. And then some radiologists, when they spoke to them, said, hey, when we do that, we don't look at the entire area, we just look at the border. It's far easier and it's far more discriminative to see when you've got the border of something. And for example, this is the liver that's being characterized over here in some of these segmentations. So there's like, it's, I think the takeaway there to think about is how there was a lot more fruitful research done when these comp computer scientists ended up speaking to radiologists into figure out how to actually solve a problem. Okay, another thing we do is characterization. That's taking image and trying to make a quantitative measurement of it. And here, some you know, machine learning models were able to take just x-rays of people's hands and from those hands be able to say how old this person is. Okay, that's quite important when you don't have good metadata, you know, age information. And it also it's important to characterize like how big a lesion is, like how big your cancer tumor is and things like that. And here's another like notion of, you know, here's an x-ray. Scientists were trying to figure out within these x-rays, you know, what sort of chest diseases do people have? And once again, they spoke to radiologists, it's a recurring theme, and they devised a far better approach by saying, look, you keep on just showing your machine learning model these chest x-rays, we never just look at an x-ray by itself. Often there's a whole bunch of background information, reports that we have to read on, like we, we read that Mr. Jonathan Durand has had a long history of smoking. So that would put a big prior or intuition that you should be looking for lung nodules, like cancer and stuff like that. So this is an example of a, a paper where they're able to do that effectively. Once again, getting the intuition of the radiologist really improved performance. And it sounds dumb that I keep on repeating that they went and spoke to the radiologists, but that's a big problem that we're gonna highlight later on, okay? And another thing that's really amazing is this notion of what we can now do with modern technology. Just say we're in Joburg Gen. Joburg Gen has one MRI machine but it's got about 10 CT scanners, those like computer tomography scanners. It's like, you'd rather, you'd want to be able to go and maybe take, you know, there's a, there's a number of reasons you'd do this, vice versa, but you'd want to maybe, because there are more CT scanners available, take a CT scan of someone and then transform that as though you had an MRI done on you. You want better contrast in the images and stuff. Or, 
you're worried about a CT scan because that exposes to you to lots of ionizing radiation, and this is in the first world. So if you have too many CT scans done, you can develop cancer. On the other hand, MRIs, because they don't emit ionizing radiation, you can have as many as you want. They're just expensive, but you won't get cancer from them. And so what people have been able to do with machine learning recently is to go from one to the other. You have a CT scan, and they can render it as though it was an MRI. Or you have an MRI, and it now looks like a CT scan. And they're able to map very, like, very well and sensitively between these two domains, which is pretty crazy if you think of it. It's like me t taking a photo of you, and suddenly it becomes an X-ray of you. That's also creepy. Um, but they haven't done that yet. So, but that's, that's kind of what we're going for over here. So when we think of this, with all these advances, obviously like we've smashed this target, okay? We have all the right technology that will enable us to now solve this problem, don't we? Okay, because there's been a lot of advances, right? Obviously this is the point where I'm like, oh, plot twist, and I say no. We haven't solved this already. So if you look into context, you have studies such as this in the first world, TextNet, where, and I'm sure you guys have seen lots of headlines similar to this, where radiologists level pneumonia detection on chest x-rays with deep learning. Okay, so you now have these computers. Remember back in the 1960s where they thought they would do well, but they weren't. Now we do have computers that are beating radiologists at diagnosing certain things. Okay, here's a paper related to that. You've got Chexbird, which is now the world's largest database of chex ray images, and computer models are beating human experts on it. They're obliterating them in some senses. So we're getting like superhuman level performance. So people once again are starting to say, ah, we can revisit that old theme of computer automated diagnosis. We don't need computer aided diagnosis anymore. We can check out the doctors again. All right, so there's a bit of hubris involved there, a little bit of pride that we can see once again. And to kind of like contrast that, we have headlines like this, still hitting. Uh, IBM's decision to halt sales of Watson AI. Everyone's heard of Watson, right? No. Okay, IBM speaks a lot about it. It was their grand, amazing, like all-encompassing artificial intelligence genius system. It would solve all your problems. It was the, Watson was the system that beat the current world champion in Jeopardy, if you remember that. So that's like a game show where you had to think really fast and stuff. It was a big challenge to computer science. So they made this thing called Watson and it was a program that beat the world champion. All right, but the problem here is they try to move into a medical domain with Watson and it's failed completely. They ran several trials in different hospitals around the world and doctors were literally saying, get this away from my patients, it's gonna kill them. Because it was making predictions that rookie doctors could see were highly erroneous. They were really bad. And so they're like, this is gonna kill our patients, get away from us, okay? So really bad thing there. DeepMind, anyone else heard of DeepMind? That's another big player in deep learning research, okay, as a research lab. It's owned by Google. They've made, if you've ever seen those videos of now reinforcement learning playing Atari, like how computers are able to beat humans at playing computer games and stuff like that. This is the technology that DeepMind developed. Okay, it's also gone into medical AI and they're wanting to pull out once again because it's really not doing good things. They're worried about what's happening. Do, do we have an idea as to why would, uh, why would this not work in those domains as opposed to them flourishing in other relationships? Okay, that's a really good question and I can kind of my presentation will visit it. Okay, yeah, sorry. So the, the question, thank you, Damien, was, you know, what is the intuition behind why these sort of approaches aren't working in, like, the medical domain? If it's worked really well in, like, natural images and computer games, why isn't this working for the medical domain? Okay, and I'll get th to that point, you know, later on in this presentation, but one of the predominant reasons is this domain is a lot more hairy than we think. There's a, there's a lot more nuanced problems that, you know, when, when you have a model, when you have this like machine learning algorithm that just has to tell the difference between a tennis ball and a dog, okay? If it gets it wrong, it's not the end of the world. If it gets it wrong and this is a human, there are huge legal ramifications behind this. That's, that's just one of the problems. 
Also, it's very easy and I can say, hey, Bob, can I get a picture of your dog, please? You know, I want to train a machine learning model on it. You can't walk up to a patient and say, hey, can I have all your medical data? I'd really like to do this, okay? There are, th so there's, there's a, this is a really complex space to be in. To give you insight to what happened with Watson, it was this notion that even though they had this very sophisticated like knowledge graph, what it essentially the system had was it had thousands upon thousands of medical cases from the start to finish of, P of cancer patients. What originally were the symptoms, what steps were taken during the pre treatment process, what was prescribed, and from all this data, Watson was supposed to gleam like these important decision-making steps so that it could say, at this next point, at the next follow-up, you should see sign X, Y, and Z, and this is what you should do because of it, if you see one thing or another. The problem was they assumed that the data was in such a way that the model, like Watson, would very be easily to disen like be able to disentangle it and present it in a nice, knowledgeable way. What ended up happening is also, I don't know if you know, IBM is notorious at overhyping their technology. And so guys were saying that this thing will cure cancer. It will discover a cure for cancer. This thing, the system isn't even trying to cure cancer. It's trying to treat cancer, all right? But it was really overhyped. And so what ended up coming out of that was there were huge expectations. The actual ability to deliver was far lower, okay? And in between, there's a whole bunch of pressure where people, you know, your entire brand, IBM, is riding on this, okay? And so what the computer scientists were forced to do is they had to kind of make stuff up sometimes because they were expected to deliver on these solutions. The technology wasn't at a level where it could do that. And so they had to make like, they were doing almost like manual work sometimes. And that was very evident to these doctors who are, have spent years and years, they're experts, they will see the problems and they'll go like, oh, this thing is doing something wrong. And in the medical domain, trust is, you know, trust is the deal breaker. If you cannot trust a system or a test, it will be shunned immediately. And so IBM in this hospital, you know, you had the head radiologist or the, the head um, of the entire you know, hospital going, no, you know, we've gotten three or four bad reports, bad enough that our junior doctors can say that they're bad, we aren't going with this any further because we're gonna endanger people. We can't play around with people's lives, okay? So this notion of overhyping, of really the technology not being where it needed to be, and also the data being extremely messy were all kind of problems that were detected over here, okay? But we'll, we'll, we'll jump into that as well. This, is, this kind of harkens on to what you're saying a bit more. Another problem with deep learning is this fact that it's, you know, I showed you just those layers and layers of these nodes and I said they're doing stuff. Well, that's the hand wavy approach that a lot of people have. The math, first of all, for deep learning and most of machine learning actually when you get to the, the bottom of it is complex, it's hairy. You do need postgraduate skills in order to really start taking these things apart and getting intuition of them. And even if you do disentangle the maths and you understand that correctly, at the end of the day, like you guys are gonna do regression as your next machine learning sprint. And you'll find there that you can fit a model that maybe has four or five free variables that can be fit to a model. A deep learning network often has orders of billions of these parameters. And so it's really hard you know, in a, in a regression model, you can kind of make sense. If one feature, if the free variable is increasing or decreasing, you can kind of say the feature that it represents is either important or less important. Try and do that to two billion parameters and go, how are they all relating to one another? And you have this idea of a very black box model, meaning you can't look inside it. You don't know why it's making the decisions it's making. And as I said, in the medical domain, that cannot fly. You have to know exactly why the model is making certain decisions, okay? So it's a very active field of study. All right, but let's step back. I want some class participation. I want all of us to feel like walking away from this presentation, you've done something or you learned something, okay? So to kind of also illustrate why this is such a hard problem, we're gonna be doctors today, okay? So I'm just gonna very quickly teach you how to read a chest X-ray. You can go home and impress your family after this if you want to. But on the left here, I've got an annotated version of an x-ray, okay? You'll see I've highlighted the lung fields. You've got the right lung field, left lung field. It's, it's inverted because this is actually a back projection. You've got like the trachea over here, the menimbrium. That's this place where your collarbones kind of meet in the center. 
You've got the heart, obviously, this pink squishy thing. You've got costophrenic angles, like they're at the bottom of this. All right, and you'll see that there's different lung segments. Anyone who didn't do biology can fall asleep if you want to. Okay, but that's this, and this is what it looks like without the annotation. You can see all those structures, right? It's clear to see, it's very simple, okay? So here's an x-ray, and what I'm gonna ask us to do is I'm gonna show us several x-rays now, and we are gonna diagnose them, okay? Because we see this is a healthy x-ray. I'm gonna show you pictures of unhealthy x-rays, and I want you to just like say which ones are wrong. But first of all, just once, Again, there's two types of orientations when we look at an x-ray. There's this posterior anterior projection and that's where like, the x-ray source is behind the person being imaged and we've also got anterior posterior where it's from the top. And it gives us, they look almost identical but they're kind of not identical sorts of images of an individual. Okay, so once again, if we're gonna be trying to read an x-ray, there's just the simple A to G of reading so these are the steps that you need to go through. You first look at the airways, okay, that's like the trachea and the lung fields, bones and soft tissue, that's just to make sure that there aren't any breaks or fractures or calluses on those, and like soft tissue, flabby arms maybe here. Cardiac size, so that's like, is the size of the heart all right? The diaphragms at the bottom to make sure that they're well formed and you can see the costophrenic angle. Are they of equal volume? Like one isn't really deflated. Okay, you look at fine detail, you look at all these little parts here, the gastric bubble, which is this thing at the bottom, that's just if you've had a good meal, it's often there and you're standing up. And then the hilum and hardware, so it's these hilar regions, and hardware is like if a person has a pacemaker. Okay, so I've just condensed maybe about three months of teaching it down into like two slides. You got it. All right, so just as an intro problem, just so that we're all aware how this process will occur, I want you to, you know, I'm gonna show you this, these images. I want you to tell me which of these is a duck, I mean, not a duck, a turtle or a gun, okay? Is it A, is it B, is it C, or D, or more than those, okay? So I'm just gonna ask you to raise your hand if you think it's either of those. And for those who are online, maybe in your venue, you can shout out the answer. Okay, so who thinks it's A, either a, du oh, either a turtle or a gun? Okay, B, do we have a turtle or a gun? Okay, we've got that. Some people are hesitant. C, is it a turtle or a gun? And D, is it a turtle or a gun? Or both? Okay, so I'm, I'm getting some, like, some responses from people over here, okay? Actually, all three of these were right. And this is actually, if anyone has ever followed the deep learning literature, the reason I put in this image it was an example of machine learning getting, getting things really wrong. It was shown this image of a turtle and it predicted a gun, okay? Very common sense because we see turtle guns walking around all the time, okay? There's a big problem, okay? But let's actually get into the meat of things for this talk, okay? So if we have to look at A, B, C, or D, um, maybe you guys can shout out here as well. Which of these have something wrong with them. It might be more than one. Um, so which ones are wrong? Is it A? Okay, is it B? Okay, not B. Is it C? No, is it D? Definitely, okay, so the consensus is A and D, right? Wow, you guys got it right, okay? So there's this opacity over here that shouldn't be there. And also you'll see that there's a lung nodule in this case, you know, in this area. Someone is unfortunate and has cancer. Uh, I just wanted to ask, is there a difference between a images and That is a fantastic question and very astute observation. So the question was, is there a difference between adult x-rays and babies, because babies are still growing? We'll see in the next two slides. Okay, once again, we repeat the same process. A, B, C, or D, which one is health, or which one of these are sick? And bonus points if you can see why. Okay, so we have a shout out of A, B, D, okay. Is it A? All right, we've got very different answers. Yes. B? Yes, B. Yes, B. C? No, no one's going for C. D? Yeah. Oh, what's wrong with D? 
We aren't, we aren't sure, but it's like this gut feel, okay? <laughs> this, this person's had something to eat or something like that. All right, so it turns out you guys got it like 50% right, but it wasn't for maybe the right reasons you're thinking. All right, over here, you'll see this opacity on the top right-hand lung field, okay? This guy has TB. And at the bottom here, this opacity is indica indicative of pneumonia, okay? But it wasn't because, yeah, it, it, that, that thing. Okay, last one, which of these two is sick, okay? These are kids now, okay? Is it A or is it B? All right, is it A? Is it B? Wait, someone's just going B. <laughs> nice. Okay, so you guys all think it's A. Why? Wait, wait, wait. Okay, one, one person be brave and volunteer. So B. Okay, so it's hardware or hardware over here. All right, the correct answer is neither of them are sick, actually. The heart is smaller. Okay, that's that's feeling good. All right, you may think that this big, like this big patch over here, may be something wrong. But actually, we all or most children, when you're growing up, when you before the age of a year, have this thing. It's called your thymus. It looks like a big opacity, like this big thing. But it's actually an organ that shrinks as you grow up until it eventually disappears. Okay. Uh, I'd have to ask my wife about that. I'm I'm not, I'm not too sure what exactly. Um, but it's an organ that's like is present and as it, it's like the appendix We don't really know why someone put it there. Okay, and it shrinks as it goes But it's a huge confounding thing because a lot of young radiologists will look at this and go heck this person has pneumonia There's this big white patch, but it's actually just a normal thing So what we can get from this is a hopefully we can appreciate reading x-rays is not easy you have to do this like highly accurately as well. It can't be a 50% chance of getting it right and wrong. And so radiologists spend years and years practicing to do it. And so this kind of introduces one of our first, uh, I'm glad that people are shouting out C or D in both um, from the actual stream. One of the things to, to realize is when we're dealing with medical data, it's not as easy to have labeled versions and we, we need our data, like when you feed a machine learning model these images, you have to be able to quite strongly say, what is the classification of this model so it can learn? And you also have to give quite strong evidence of, is it this region over here that has pathology or has something wrong? Is it another region? Is it maybe one of the ribs that are broken? And because we can't easily get this information out, it leads to a lot of problems. You have to pay a radiologist to do this. Remember when I spoke about deep learning, we said cello networks just require a little bit of data and deep learning requires a lot of data. So we aren't talking about like having a radiologist make one or two of these images. They need millions of images. Now for someone who's highly skilled, they don't have time to label a million images. Okay. That's a, a huge problem. Okay. So they're data issues. Now, because we try and get a lot of data in order to train these different sorts of models, we have this problem, as I was saying, with labeling constraints, okay? We try and invent methods as humans to label a lot of these images without having a radiologist or an expert. And it doesn't always have to be just chest x-rays, this is an example. But of different sort of medical images, we need to have an expert to label each of these and we try and get around that in a number of different ways. Often what happens though is, Either you have images that have no labels associated, which is a big problem because it's, it's, an, it's an unsupervised exercise where you're saying to this model, find out what's wrong in this image and I won't tell you what's wrong. And then what it ends up learning is just a whole bunch of statistical correlations. Like I see black dots in the corner of this image, therefore that must be the thing that means it's sick. And that's not a logical conclusion. This is an example of that where the actual pathology, you know, this is an example of the the model that was used finding the correct pathology and you can see this heat map indicating over here that it found something wrong. In other images this perfectly healthy person was flagged as being sick because and it's hard to see between these two arrows but there's this pipe and essentially what this pipe represented is this person was in ICU okay so it flags this pipe as having a very strong like statistical correlation with someone being sick and so they said this person has emphysemia like, this person is very sick, but they didn't have it. They were just in ICU, okay? That's a big problem. Another thing is when you've got a scarce amount of these radiologists or like people to label this data, this is an example of a very famous and widely used uh, CT scan data set where they're looking for lung nodules for cancer. 
in this data set, they had three radiologists that were kind of labeling where all the bad things were in these slices. Turns out that they had an agreement rate of 33%, meaning, you know, for every image, two of the three radiologists would disagree where that was, you know, where, where those bad things were. Unfortunately, this data set got out into the wild. Like, even though there was this very low level of agreement, a lot of people used it to train like machine learning programs. And so, obviously, if you feed it garbage information, the thing's going to learn to have garbage predictions. And that erodes trust once again. So, another thing is, we, we can find like a thousand pictures of dogs and a thousand pictures of cars, and you can get, you know, an equal balance of those. But often in the case of medical conditions we're trying to detect, there's this idea of imbalance where it's far easier to you know, find a thousand healthy patients than a thousand people with a rare genetic disorder that causes a certain manifestation of something. Now because there's this huge imbalance, you guys, when you get to machine learning, you realize that having data imbalance in your problems is a, oh, in, your, in your, your kind of architectures, that's a big problem. Okay? That's another thing that hampers us within this medical domain. And this last point is quite a funny one, that we can't solve these problems in a, in a nice traditional way. If anyone knows or has heard of the data set ImageNet before, you may have heard it in relation to deep learning, but it's essentially it's a data set that contains over 10 million images that are used to train different machine learning models. So doctors said, well, can't we just get 10 million images for you know stuff like this? And this is like pink and purple sludge. It's essentially, it's histopathology data. It's like cross sections of like tissue, human tissue. And you look at it under the microscope and you can look at different things to see if this is cancer or not. Now, they got the 10 million natural images of cars and dogs and that by just putting that online and they used something called Amazon Mechanical Turk. It's this program where you can pay people very cheaply. Think of them sitting in like a sweatshop and basically they would label data for you. They try to do the same thing. It's a framework called Agnet. They try to do that with medical images and they came back with horrendous results. They thought they could maybe give a person an, an image of one of these slides. They could label it for them and then they would be good at labeling other images. They got it horribly wrong. Okay? So there's no way to really scale the data we have. Okay? This becomes a large open problem that's been outlined. This, is, this paper was published at the end of 2018, 2019. So it's a very relevant problem that we have where we need to find intelligent ways of either helping our models learn with as little help as possible, like you just give it data and you don't have to actually supervise it too much, or we have to make them learn with far less data. Okay? Another thing is there's big implementation impediments. Okay? And this is where I was saying if we step back other problems in the medical sphere that become a huge like, issue or barrier. Okay? Here I've said institutional trust issues and this is you know, DeepMind, that company I was speaking about earlier, it actually it was given a whole bunch of data by the NHS. This is like London, or not London, the UK's healthcare system. It was given a whole bunch of medical data but it was used improperly in the sense that they didn't get proper permission to use it all, but they ended up using it anyway. And so the NHS immediately said, look, you violated certain privacy agreements, we're taking all the data back. All right? You can't make a model if you're taking away all this data again. Okay? So the one big learning there is you have to be very, very pedantic. You have to be very careful when you're actually dealing with this data because it's sensitive and the institutional policies around it. Actually in places like you know, the UK, you've got, the, you've got various regulations coming out now that specify how you can and cannot use data, even if you're using it for machine learning or something else, GDRP. In South Africa, has anyone heard of Poppy? And it's not your, like a, a nice girl down the road from you. Poppy is the Protection of Information Act, okay? And it, it speaks to how we can or cannot, you know, use personal information anymore. Hopefully in the future people shouldn't like spam call you because your information shouldn't be allowed to be go out or be used by third parties without your explicit permission. Okay? And here's another one. Google accused of inappropriate access to medical data. Okay? And there's a class action lawsuit. The other thing that I kind of spoke to earlier is this notion of you can think of us as technical people trying to look at X-ray images and trying to say like what it is, okay? Whether it's a check, like whether there's something wrong or not. Well, it turns out there's a really big disconnect, and especially it's all around the world, but especially in South Africa, between the people who make policy, our politicians, 
ourselves as practitioners, or actually we're the programmers, and then the practitioners who are the doctors. See, you might think it's a really great idea to make a medical application that like, will take chest x-rays and give the result. Turns out that a radiologist or a doctor might not actually need that in their workflow. There might be other things that are far more important to them. And just because you don't have experience in the field, you think your solution, and I just use that as kind of like an anecdotal example, but you might think your solution actually will go a, lo a long way to helping, but it actually is irrelevant to what doctors actually do. And so what it speaks to is we need far tighter collaboration between these three parties in order to actually make meaningful solutions. So my suggestion is if anyone feels like becoming president, please do. You'll do the whole data science community a huge favor. Or if you want to become a doctor now, drop out and start your medical degree. It's easy enough. Okay? But we need, we need tighter cohesion between these parties. Okay? Another thing is this idea of technical debt. It's, it's easy to, to make a quick solution. You guys are going to be making Power BI dashboards and explain. It's easy to make something and just put it out to the world. You can't do that so much in the medical care system because what has often happened is people will make technological advances. They will release those to doctors and go like, okay, this system works fantastically without really investing and in making sure it works correctly across a number of trials or a number of individuals. And that means things go wrong and there's less trust in the system. Okay? There's a huge problem with technical debt or things that are being released into the wild and breaking. Okay? And the last thing that I spoke about, model accountability again, we can't look inside these, these models very well. Okay? And so the big problem here, the, the anecdotal example of a turtle being classified as a gun, All right, there's this EU GDRP policy that's come out and essentially what it speaks to is unless you're able to know exactly why your machine learning model has made a certain prediction, you can't use it. So even if it gives you like superhuman performance and it's tested and it always gives you superhuman performance, unless you can say why it makes the predictions it does, you can't use it by law, which is a huge roadblock for all of us, especially in this field where we're wanting to do data science, but we have to prove that there's no bias in our data science. We have to prove that you know there is purely a data-driven decision that there's no bias in the data and there's no bias in the model itself, okay? Which is a huge thing. And so it's something that you need to think about as data scientists as well as you go forward. All right. In our own continent, Michael, yeah. Yeah, so you, you highlight a, a very interesting notion, and just for the audience who hasn't heard, um, Michael was saying, you know, isn't it possible then if you've got this black box model, black black box model, can't you take a machine learning algorithm that will look at the black box model and say like, this is what its input, this is its output, and this is why it's predicted that. So kind of like to get machine learning to diagnose machine learning, and there are actually techniques like that. So what people will do is they'll take this model. It will look at all its inputs, all its outputs, and it'll fit a simple linear model on top of that to say, given your inputs, like this is like the simple weight. So here are the simple variables that make a decision to give the output. And so um, it, it slips my mind. I'm, I'm always want to say slate is the acronym for the, the algorithm, but I know it's not that, but it's pretty similar. So there are approaches that people are taking like that. The big problem is that's only like it gets us halfway there you can see like what you think the model is considering but you aren't actually looking at those direct parameters of the model itself you're now looking at an abstraction of the model which isn't a true abstraction because you've like you're modeling the model okay so it still doesn't give us that explainability that we want it's it's kind of a step there but it doesn't give us you know it doesn't get us there completely I think we can speak about this afterwards because I just want to respect time, but it is an important thing. Like my PhD involves explainability. Um, it's looking at symbolic explainability. And so it's trying to just get the like get these models to explain things in concepts that humans understand and that might help bridge the gap. But if anyone's interested, speak to me afterwards about it. Because obviously I'm very passionate. I'm spending some of my some years of my life doing this. Okay. But when we think of you know, the problems I've outlined, they're, they're general to the world. I want to speak about some of the constraints in our own continent, in Africa, if we think about it. 
So the first thing to think of is, you know, there's always disparity, unfortunately, between ourselves as Africa and the rest of the world or developing countries. This is an image of an adult from a chest x-ray data set in the first world. Okay, this is that Chexpert data set. And here is the sort of imaging we get. Obviously, you can see these are very different. Both of these kids are healthy. I mean, actually, this is a kid, this is an adult. But both of them are healthy, but you can see the radiographs look very different. The problem is there's a lot of this data available. There's very little of this data. And that's because we don't have you know, like the infrastructure to collect x-rays or to collect medical images on a scale that's actually required to train some of these state-of-the-art machine learning techniques on them. Okay? And so that's one big thing. There's a lack of transferability between what the first world is doing in research and what we're trying to do as Africa in terms of research. Another thing is we really have to solve our own problems because the sort of diseases that we even deal with are very different. Okay? South Africa has extremely high HIV burden. And now when you've got something like TB and you're trying to diagnose it, TB in an individual without HIV looks very different from an individual with HIV and TB. Okay? So we have to, we actually essentially, unless someone feels very generous and comes from the first world country and tries to solve these problems, they're just going to sit around because America is not going to try and solve TB with HIV comorbidity, like having both of those together. It's, it, it's too rare a case to make an economic point for it. So we have to make that. Okay. Another thing is this notion of let's ground ourselves there's also big infrastructure problems that we have. And this is even before we do any fancy machine learning. This is just a graph of the number of MRI machines and CT scanners we have, or well, this is just MRIs, you know, within South Africa as a whole. And you can, you can see that, you know, like for the private healthcare, we've got quite a few. This is the general, you know, region average of the number. But for public hospitals per individual, we have a very low number of scanners available, okay? We have only, in terms of these MRI scanners, a couple speckled across the country. And that's to serve a huge patient burden. And so we have to be realistic. If we start trying to like, develop methods that will give us very good results with MRI data, we have to think of how, much, like, how many scanners are even available that you could apply this to, okay? Rather pick a more common modality like chest x-rays or you know, just general x-rays instead of MRIs or PET scanners and things like that just because of how common this stuff is. Okay? And the last thing I'd just point out is there's a, a lack of a strong community. Within, if we speak about medical imaging, there are very few. You know, we're holding a, a conference. It's, has anyone applied to the deep learning in DABA? The, the Indaba X, yeah. Has anyone applied to the deep learning Indaba X in South Africa? Okay, Damien, shout out. Anyone else, maybe? Okay, but what you'll find is the machine learning community is growing in South Africa, but it's still pretty small. Hopefully more of you will be a part of it by the end of this year. But the medical subset of that is extremely small. Okay, there are very few individuals who are interested in this. And that's, that's a big problem. Um, but it's also a big opportunity. All right, so I'm also going to just, you know, to kind of cap this off, this is my last slide, I promise, and actually there's one more slide, but it's, I won't speak about it. Just, you know, with a, a story to contextualize things as well, when we speak of problems within South Africa, I've showed you a whole bunch of state-of-the-art stuff. I know we've gone, like, through a whiz run through this entire presentation, and there are a lot of new concepts that you're having to think about, but this story kind of contextualizes things quite well. So I'm busy doing my PhD at WITS, and I'm having this meeting with my supervisor when he gets, you know, he gets contacted by a hematologist. Hematologist is a person that looks at blood, essentially, under the microscope. And what this person does, or, you know, requests of my supervisor, she says, I need to have an urgent meeting with you. People are dying and we need to save them. And there's nothing like that galvanizes you or makes you feel excited when people are dying and someone says you can save them, okay? You feel like Superman or something like that. And so we kind of mentally prepare for this big challenge because she gave us maybe like she gave us a bit of prep around this, uh, the challenge she had, and we, we kind of thought of all these big solutions. Essentially, her problem was she was sitting in a central hospital, okay, somewhere like Joburg Gen down the road here. Now, Joburg Gen sent, like, services a whole bunch of little clinics around this region, and what happens there is someone will come in for a blood test, they will take the smear. 
and they'll look at that under the microscope and they'll go, goodness, this person, this blood looks weird. I don't know what it is exactly, but it doesn't look good. Okay? So they can't diagnose it themselves. They don't have the skills. So they take these slides, send it with a private courier. That takes maybe one or two days. It gets to the hospital here. The person, the hematologist that spoke to us, takes them, looks under the microscope and goes, goodness, this person has leukemia. They need a blood transfusion now to save them. The problem is the blood transfusion needed to happen two days ago to save the person, not two days later. So that person is already dead. Okay? And so she comes with this problem and you know, we're thinking of all these elegant solutions. After a long conversation, it turns out she needed some way to transmit video from one microscope to her so that she could look in real time at just like the slides. That was all she needed. And that would save people's lives because she could instantaneously say to the person in the clinic, you are looking at leukemia. Give this person blood transfusion. And that's what the system doesn't have at the moment. So it's not like this radical machine learning solution that's required. She basically needed WhatsApp video calling on a microscope. And that would save people. And so I think, you know, as, as a close to this, you know, when we, when we think of things in general, you know, machine learning with medical image analysis, it's really difficult. Um, but it's also a great place to be working in, all right, because it's very open. Other fields will be, you know, more flooded. This is somewhere that, you know, you don't have to be a doctor in order to operate here, but it's got a lot of potential. There's a lot of low-hanging fruits, okay? So there are many unique challenges that are unique to South Africa, unique to Africa. And so if you ever wanted to, you know, instead of just earning a lot of money as a data scientist, if you also wanted to make a difference, maybe there was somewhere in the back of your mind, probably the money more. But once again, there's this notion that you can make a big difference because there are so many low-hanging problems, like this one. You just have to develop an app that can privately send video streams from one person to another, okay, in a curated way. It's, it's not in applying rocket science. It's, it's doing something simple like that, and you can really save lives, okay? And so really in understanding that, like, that's, that's the takeaway message that I'd like you to realize, that it is a complex and difficult field, but it's also an open field, and there's so many opportunities here in South Africa especially for you to make a difference, okay? So if anyone has further questions, uh, I'll let you do that offline. I've, I've kind of gone ten, 10 minutes over time, but grateful um, for what you've done. Damien's asked if there are any questions from the online cohort, but while we wait on those, maybe if anyone has one or two questions. Okay. Yeah, we can, we can send that link out. I think the registration is unfortunately already over for that. But yeah, unfortunately, it happens later this month in March, and it's at the University of Pretoria. But what we'll be opening up later on this year is the deep learning in Darba, and that's for the whole of Africa. So it's a machine learning conference, especially around deep learning, and it's different subfields. But that is for the entire African continent. So delegates, actually, you have quite a few people coming from overseas as well, other than just Africa. But it's, it's like our, our own machine learning conference, it's the hub. As a student, you're really encouraged to, you know, you can get a travel grant if you get accepted into the Deep Learning Daba. This year it's in, um, no, it's the Deep Learning Daba X is in Pretoria. The, 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 yeah, it's, it's in Tunisia, so you get a bit of a cultural experience and there are travel grants, so you, if you get accepted, you can get a, like your flights paid, paid for and stuff in order to get there, okay. So that's something to think of. Okay, question is why doesn't the medical field pay a lot if the demand is so big, okay? Well, I suppose that's all relative. So we don't actually in South Africa, if anyone's had the misfortune of doing a biomedical engineering degree, you'll find that like if you aren't a doctor and you're in an allied or associated field of study in medicine, we don't really have the technological, and I'm speaking now from a medical imaging perspective, we don't have like the enough companies or enough traction to really sell solutions to government. If you look at a lot of government institutions, I used to work at the CSIR and I worked with a branch that was doing kind of like medical imaging solutions for government. Like it would take five or more years to try and get a solution even considered by government. And so there's very low turnaround right there. What often happens in South Africa is we buy a lot of our technology from overseas, okay? So 
they get paid a ton of money and South, South Africa will pay top dollar for medical solutions. The big problem is we don't have a strong enough sort of basis here for, to create our own solutions for our own country yet. As I say, there's, it's a big wide open field, there's a lot of low hanging fruit, but there are steps that you need to overcome in order to do it. It's not like you can do a, a, a medical startup and in a week you are already um, making a profit in that sense. It does have to go through steps, but there are a lot of open problems and government is slowly changing. But you, know, you can get paid quite a lot in this space if you are overseas and hopefully that will start changing in South Africa when there's more of a demand for it. There's a question back there. Okay, so just to contextualize that question, it's an interesting one. You know, is it possible to train a machine learning system or just a computer in general? All the information we know, and I put that caveat there because we don't know everything, by the way, but all that we know about the body, down from DNA all the way up to us as an individual, can we teach that all to a computer system? to make it like better understand, if I'm getting it correctly, better understand the problems, okay? So the big constraint there is this assumption, we already have that, it's called an encyclopedia, you know, it, it, it maintains all this information. Having a stateful and aware representation and how this information actually interrelates and what it means, like to give it actual meaning, is a, a, like that's the level of general artificial intelligence. Knowing how like, because you can give a lot of information to a machine learning system and based on the information you give it, it can give you, you know, like it can classify your information, it can give you predictions based on the information you've given, but at no point is it aware. It just knows that it's being given numerical data and it will spit out what it considers a numerical result, which is a classification or a clustering or something like that. We have no real fundamental like this underbed of understanding of what is being given. So you could have like, for example, a system that will look at DNA, you give it certain DNA strands and it'll tell you if there's something abnormal or not. But it's not gonna say like, give a, give a pathology and it will immediately come to you and say, oh, I see because of this certain genotype that is associated with you, that's why something is wrong in you. There's like, we are, we are miles from that. Miles and miles and miles, okay? So this notion of like artificial general intelligence, in this sense, like having a holistic doctor that just understands you completely from the DNA up, we are nowhere near that. Because we are nowhere near having something that is like sentient. And that's, that's what a lot of like literature propagates when they say within the next five years we're gonna have artificial general intelligence. We're very far from that, okay? People are drinking their own Kool-Aid as my supervisor used to say. Okay. There's another question. I think, I think just to add on to what you just said in terms of the term of that is that I believe that we, we ourselves, human beings, have not yet described, quantified, or, or even benchmarked what gray looks like. Because I believe that we teach the machines black and white, and that's how they actually speak at the conditions. But we've never talked about what gray looks like. And we, human beings, actually use discussion the gray areas actually make those judgment calls. And so if ourselves, if, if we humans ourselves, we have not actually benchmark, quantify, describe what great standards look like, how then would we then teach a machine how to identify great? I think that's a challenge. I think, yeah, that's a, a really good philosophical point to go on. Um, and I'm glad that you bring it up. And, and basically what the thing was, you know, our machines don't learn properly or they aren't performing too well because we, we, we kind of give them hard decisions. We give them black and white and there's a lot of gray in between, uncertainty, I suppose. And what I would say kind of stepping back from that is 
one thing that's inherently bad within the field of machine learning is we forget or we fail to disentangle this, and I'm going to call it cognitive bias we have. We know how to do something. If I had to ask you how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, that's very American, but if I asked you to make a sandwich with polony on it, you would know how to do that. If I had to say describe, you remember in like grade five or grade six, write down instructions on how to make a polony sandwich, like you could do that maybe. But we now think that a computer should be able to do that. If I tell it what pieces of bread are, what polony is, what a knife is, and being able to cut polony, it's gonna be able to build a sandwich. And that's a huge amount of cognitive bias because what we don't realize is as humans, as we solve problems and we're in the world, there's a whole bunch of understanding that is deep and intrinsic within our knowledge. Okay? And we take a whole bunch of information and so when we approach a problem, there's a whole bunch of information that's there that we aren't even aware we're aware of. But we bring it to the fore and we use it to solve things. We need to get systems that are able to have that knowledge. And you can think of like a simple example, and my, you know, like I've used this in conversation quite a few times. We've got systems where I can take a picture of like, and so for those of you who aren't here, just say there's a table in front of me and there's a remote on the table. And I, I take a picture of that remote. I can get a, like a, a machine learning model very easily to say that is a remote. But if I had to ask, you know, is the remote stuck to the table? You might use your intuition to say like, remotes aren't often stuck to the table. But to the machine learning model, all it sees is this picture with pixels. It has no way of actually disentangling it. Actually, as a human being, you can walk up to the picture, I mean, you can walk up to the remote and poke it, and it will move and you'll go, ah, oh, it's not super glued to the table. No one pulled a practical joke. But a model has no way of actually going outside of that. But we'll forget that as human beings. We'll forget the limits of the information we're actually presenting to a system and what we're expecting it to do based on that. Okay. So it's a deep and philosophical thing that we're still kind of grappling with about how we get all the cognitive bias out and how to actually get all the relevant information for something to behave like a human being because we almost have to give it the full sensory experience that a human being enjoys over many years. We have to realize that. And so now we give a system a very small amount of information and we expect it to do the same thing. Okay. There's, there's two questions over here. Uh, I want to research a cause for, con for con uh, congenital heart defect. If it is said that there is no known cause, if you know anything about that, would you say it is a feasible idea and where can I start? Advice would really be appreciated, I think. Okay, so I think, you know, and there's, there's a correction as well. Um, Nokwanda, let's take that question offline because I, I think for the general audience, I'm not able to hypothesize. I'm not a doctor, by the way. Even if I use medical terms, I am an electrical engineer. I did my master's in biomedical imaging. Hence, there's you know, some knowledge in this field. But we, you know, maybe send me a personal Slack message and afterwards we can take this, the conversation further where I can kind of address the question. I think we're out of time. Damien's indicating. Just a comment from Cape Town to say great talk. Okay, awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah, if there are any more questions, we can take it offline, but thanks for being here.